Thanks, thanks to all of you for showing up. Uh, I know it's the start of the long weekend, and you know, there's just only other way to, to pay patience. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Adam. Uh, we've known Adam for over uh, three and a half years now. He came as an intern in 2016 with the nurse. Uh, and, and since then, we've been collaborating with uh, Adam and Jim Crutchfield at UC Davis on uh, various exciting ways of using physics to do uh, unsupervised learning for complex systems. Uh, Adam is a PhD candidate in physics, uh, just about to graduate in a, in a few months uh, at the Complexity Sciences Center, where Jim Crutchfield is, uh, is a professor and his advisor. And uh, today we'll learn about various different uh, physics-based approaches to um, segmentation and unsupervised learning in complex systems. Thank you. Thanks, Karthik. Everyone, thanks for being here. Uh, so I may have gone a little overboard with the title here. Uh, some really interesting concepts of emergence and far from equilibrium that I, I really like. But I don't think for time's sake I'm going to go into as much detail on those as I originally intended. Um, what I want to get across though is that this phenomenon of self-organization presents real challenges for traditional tools in physics, but machine learning uh, offers some new opportunities for progress. So in particular, I want to talk about the machine learning approach I've been developing based on this idea of intrinsic computation and argue that it's particularly well suited for this problem of self-organization. Um, the motivating example or problem of self-organization for this talk is extreme weather events and climate. Um, I'll give a brief introduction to that and some work done here at NERSC of using supervised deep learning approaches to identify these events in large climate data sets. From a machine learning perspective, this is a hard problem because um, ground truth labels for these events do not exist. So our approach in this talk is in essence gonna be to try and define a ground truth for these events from physical principles. And we wanna do this kind of from a more general perspective where we view extreme weather events as these more general coherent structures. So I'll talk a bit about what those are um, and give a, an introductory example of coherent vortices and 2D turbulence, give a little preview of what our method does there and how it compares to some state-of-the-art methods. So if I want to claim that our approach is some approach to a ground truth, um, that's a strong claim to make. So the, the middle of the talk, I want to kind of give some justification for that. Um, we'll start with an algebraic perspective and define patterns as generalized symmetries, that's where this intrinsic, intrinsic computation is gonna come in for that definition. Um, broken symmetries are gonna play a key role in our theory, and in particular, patterns as generalized symmetries are what we're gonna see coherent structures break. Um, from there, I'll, I'll go into the details of our method based on intrinsic computation, and then um, demonstrate its application on these fairly well understood cellular automata models. Um, We'll come back to complex fluid flows and we'll see some preliminary results of extreme weather segmentation on CAM5 water vapor data. Uh, I'll touch briefly on our HPEC implementation in Python that is required to get these results um, and then go into some future directions of see for this work and how it ties into deep learning actually. Okay, so start with extreme weather and how it's changing as the climate warms. So there are questions we're interested in. Are hurricanes going to increase in intensity and frequency as sea surface temperature rises? Um, these long sort of arm-like storm structures, atmospheric rivers uh, provide most of the water for California. We would like to know if those storms are gonna change track at some point and stop giving us the water that we very much need. Um, so a powerful tool we have to try and answer these questions are these um, high resolution general circulation climate models. See an example of in this picture um, where we can simulate alternative climate scenarios and, and see what happens. But if you want to ask these detailed questions about these weather events, like are atmospheric rivers going to keep hitting California? It's a very specific question that we need to be able to identify these storms ideally at a pixel level basis. And that pixel level identification is the so called segmentation problem. Um, rather than doing that by hand with MS Paint, as I've done for a demonstration here, 
you know, if we're, we want to look at these in hundreds of terabytes of climate data, we need some automated and robust methods to do this. So you might think, well, okay, it's a perfect problem for machine learning, right? Um, and in fact, this has kind of become a very popular problem in the deep learning community. It started here for Bob's group at NERSC. Um, so some example images here are shown. Because there's not ground truth, they use the automated heuristics of Tika, also developed here, as proximate training labels. So you can see the image on the left is an example output of atmospheric river segmentation from Tika. And on the right is output from a trained neural network. We can see in this case that the neural network gives a sort of more uh, physically reasonable, you could argue, output for this example. Um, so as I mentioned, this is a popular problem these days in the deep learning community. It's been very productive, including um, a winner of the Gordon Bell Prize in 2018 for exascale deep learning on this problem. Um, if we go back to the climate problem, though, this lack of ground truth is a real issue. So subsequent studies using like um, spherical neural networks are reaching accuracy levels over 97%. I think even more recent results are over 98% now. Um, so essentially, the, the networks are just reproducing the output of Tika at that point, right? So um, the, the heuristics of Tika are, are based on these sort of subjective thresholding conditions. So you're building that into your deep learning model if you're training on Tika. And then, you know, if you're just reproducing Tika, why not use Tika itself? And we know there's some issues with these um, thresholding conditions. They're very model dependent. Um, there's some issues there. So as I said, we kind of want to step back and take a different approach for this and um, come up with a rather than the supervised training paradigm, see this as a fundamentally unsupervised paradigm, and then again try and can we come up with a ground truth for more physical principles? Um, and we're going to do this from this perspective of coherent structures. So here's an image from the NASA Juno spacecraft of Jupiter. Um, just off the bat, Obviously, the dynamics here, you can tell, are pretty chaotic and turbulent at very small scales. But large scale, there is some organization here, some quote unquote structure. This idea of coherent structures is a sort of like underlying lower dimensional skeleton that greatly organizes the overall dynamics of the system. And it's, they're particularly influential in, in transport processes. So something you can probably notice uh, with Jupiter are the zonal belts that form. And the, the barriers between those are these strong um, jet streams that act as north-south uh, north transport barriers that define these zonal belts. Throughout, you can also see their vortices at all different scales, including the famous big old red spot there. Um, these are known to be responsible for so-called levee flights in turbulent systems where particles or objects kind of get sucked up into a vortex and go for a ride. It's known as sort of anomalous diffusion. So that's a little taste of what coherent structures are. From a physics perspective, uh, it's a very challenging problem, again. Um, there's no general theory for these structures or how to predict how they all merge. There are a few things we do know, though, and that is that system details and histories matter in these cases. And that kind of motivates the sort of instant-based modeling of machine learning. So even though we saw some issues there, um, there's reason to think that it's, it's worth pursuing. So in particular, a problem that machine learning can address with coherent structures is just how to describe these things. Like what is a mathematical description of the great red spot? Um, so instead of trying to kind of come up with an explicit description, can we teach an algorithm to learn a principal description? So, in general, um, this is an, an active and open problem. Again, there's no ground truth. But from the, uh, this Lagrangian approach to coherent structures has gained popularity in recent years. So in this, as I mentioned, coherent structures are impactful in transport. So you want to try and identify their signatures based on um, Lagrangian transport in the system. 
So, uh, for example, down here, uh, this is one of the state-of-the-art methods, the, the geodesic, which views coherent structures as these sort of material surfaces that have characteristic deformation properties. So imagine every point on the surface being evolved under Lagrangian flow, it's like a smooth deformation of the surface. And particular ways that surfaces get deformed might define them as coherent structures, like the, the green circles outline their segmentation for these coherent vortices. Um, the one next to it in the bottom right corner, LABDs, and the state-of-the-art method particularly designed for these vortices. And you see they agree on some, but LABD picks up some extra things uh, outlined in the black circles that geodesic does not. So um, we got hold of this data set and applied our method to it. So what we see here on the, the far left is the observable vorticity field. I've added some annotated bounding boxes here to outline the vortices identified by the previous methods we just looked at. So the green bounding boxes are what geodesic and LAVD both capture. Red are additional things that LAVD captures. And then yellow are some new things that we capture. So our method is um, a latent state representation um, model. So the, the two other images in the middle and the right are um, latent representation fields. So each pixel in the observable field gets mapped to a local latent state value. So the individual colors you see in the middle and the right are uh, particular unique labels for these states. So in particular in the middle, we see that the, the sort of background potential flow all gets mapped to the same state. And that creates a sort of local Euclidean symmetry in the latent field. And the other states, the outlying vortices, break that symmetry. So we identify the coherent vortices in this case as broken symmetries. Um, if we look at the observable field, though, we can see there is still some, some more structure in that background flow. And we can actually tune our parameters to capture, like in the right, some of that, more of that structural detail, but would still outline the vortices with unique sets of latent states. Um, so our method is a space-time segmentation. This is just spatial snapshots. We can have videos. In this particular case, we trained on the um, square of the vorticity field, which has stronger separation between vortices and background. Just for impact, we'll come back later and see videos of the other two cases. So we're seeing it evolve here. Vortices are moving under the flow. Um, I should mention the, because each point in space time gets mapped to um, a local latent variable, there's a shared coordinate geometry between the observable space time field and the latent space time field, as you can probably see from the video. Uh, that's a, a key property of our, our method, and we'll come back to that a few times. Yeah. Why do you have the so the annulus around the central vortex? Yeah. It's broken up into two yeah. two states. What's going on there? That's something with the squared vorticity field. So I'm still I'm yeah. Trained this on the squared vorticity field, but I'm showing comparison with the regular vorticity field. Um, I need to go look and see what the squared vorticity field looks like, but it is a property of that square. Okay, so it's nice that we saw some agreement between these state-of-the-art methods and our method, but there's some, some difference, right? So why, why might we want to believe that ours is, I don't want to claim it's the right method, but uh, what, what are some good properties of our method that maybe convince us that it's on the right track? So we want to go to this idea of a pattern. And if you think of pattern, you might think in your head an, an exact symmetry pattern, like you see here. Um, and these have an algebraic, algebraic description in terms of group theory. So that's the set of all transformations that return the object to itself and compositions of those transformations that together give another transformation that return the object to itself. Um, in particular, we want to focus in on translation symmetry here. So imagine any of these images Imagine them repeating infinitely, take it, shift it over, and it looks like itself again. Uh, okay, so let's get even more simple. We have a binary string here. We can see that it's translation variant. If I take it, shift it over, 
I get that string again. Um, so there is a group algebra that describes these uh, translations and how they relate. Is there a different representation that we can have that captures that? So we want to look at these finite state machines, um, these machine presentations as they're called. Um, you can think of as describing the set of all indexed by infinite strings that have this repeating pattern of three zeros, three ones, three zeros, three ones, et cetera. So this, the study of these kind of sets of by infinite strings with particular patterns is known as symbolic dynamics, that this interesting interface between dynamical systems theory and computation theory, and it serves as the, the mathematical foundations for the theory of pattern and structure we want to develop here. So in particular, for translation of variant strings, we can see that this machine presentation actually captures the quotient group of the symmetry. So that's the set of all transformations that do change my object, but sequentially will bring it back to itself. And this is nice because it kind of captures internal structure of the symmetry. So it's like the internal states and in our transitions are like a counter that track the phase of the pattern. So if I have, you know, my string and its index, I can ask in my current index, I see a one. Is that like the first one in a block of three, the middle, the last? It's equivalent to saying, was the one emitted from state A, state B, or state C? And this notion of internal states and their relations in, among each other are, are key to our development. Those are like the um, local latent states I was mentioning before. Um, so it's nice that they capture exact symmetry in this way. Here though, we have another bi-infinite string. It is not translation invariance, but it does contain pattern. I don't know if anyone happens to see the pattern here. If you stare at it long enough, you'll notice that blocks of ones always come in even lengths, bounded by zeros. So the set of all index strings with this pattern, where there are no odd length blocks of ones bound by zero. This is called the even process or the, the even shift in symbolic dynamics. Its machine presentation is here. And we can see there's a nice visual interpretability that the, the structure of this machine, its organization, restricts the strings that it produces to enforce the pattern. So if I'm in state A, I can emit a zero or a one. If I emit a zero, I go back to state A, I can repeat. If I emit a one, I go to state B, and then I'm forced to emit another one, ensuring that ones come in odd length blocks. So there is an algebra, this algebraic description of this. Um, the details are not super important. Just want to give a little flavor of how this works. So this is a semigroup algebra where the binary relation is concatenation of strings. It's generated by concatenation of the single symbols plus this absorbing element E where concatenation with E always returns E. That's why it's an absorbing element. And, and E captures the restrictions that enforce the pattern. So for instance, for this even uh, shift, this relation 0, 1, 0 goes to E enforces that the smallest block of odd length ones, 0, 1, 0, is forbidden. Um, so you can see I add these sort of forbidden states to the machine that just cycles on E. So if I'm in state A, see a zero, go to state A, and one to B. If I see a zero, then I go to this forbidden state and just cycle there on ease. It's just to say that, that that word is not allowed. Yeah. So the forbidden state, um, why do you add that there? Just for graphical interpretation, just to... But it just means you can't to show, show that, that that's not... Like yeah, when you, when you go to that state, it's kind of like, if you end up in that state, stop and throw out okay. your word. It's so not allowed. It's forbidden, yeah. It's kind of like a reject state. Just think like finite state machine. Um, yeah, these other two relations on the right combined with that, the one on the left, similarly ensure that larger blocks of odd length ones get mapped to E. So again, just wanted to give, um, to show that there is an algebraic description of patterns in this way. And that as we just saw, it can capture exact symmetries and in fact, from this perspective, we see that exact symmetry is a pretty restrictive property. Um, the machine presentation, as we saw in the previous one, cannot have any local branching, or otherwise the pattern wouldn't necessarily be guaranteed to exactly repeat. 
Okay, so how do we use this idea of intrinsic computation to find pattern and structure in physical systems? So the ideas behind um, our method originated in, in the setting where you can imagine there's a continuously evolving dynamical system. It's being measured by a finite precision measurement device and then it outputs some observed sequence of measurement symbols. Yep. So is that a single pixel? Yes. Or is that like, I just want to understand like what, what is string referring to? Right, so if we take the state space of our dynamical system, um, we chop it up into finite elements, okay. and those elements are sort of the possible measurement outputs our device can read. So if our state space is the unit interval, dynamical system that maps the unit interval to itself, you can divide that in half and say the left, if my state is on the left of one half, it's a zero, if it's on the right, it's a one. And my output measurement will then be zeros and ones. Okay. This is a little character trick here. Yeah. Um, so these, these objects that are output, these strings, bi um, binary strings in some cases, are like these, structured stochastic processes, these kind of objects of symbolic dynamics we were just looking at. And, and therefore we can use machine presentations to formally capture the pattern and structure in those. So from observed data, we define the internal states of our machine presentation based on this notion of equivalent histories. So two paths are considered causally equivalent if the distribution of futures that follow from those pasts is the same. And the equivalence classes of those, the equivalence classes generated by this equivalence relation are the internal states of the machine, what we call causal states. Um, so this is actually defining internal states of finite state machines as equivalent histories goes way back. Huffman and Minsky worked on this. Um, this is kind of just a stochastic generalization for various reasons. Um, a note that the word causal here is not meant to imply that these discover causal relations, but rather built on an assumption of sort of weak causality that the future follows the past, is influenced by the past. Um, so these produce minimal, the states they produce are presentations for a minimal machine, and they are also um, optimal predictors of the process. So these causal states defined by this causal relation can show our unique minimal sufficient statistics of the past for predicting the future. The idea is if my string say has a pattern, I can get a compressed representation that optimally produces it, I've sort of captured that pattern. When we go to space time, as we're interested here, the idea is to apply this locally and have this local notion of causal equivalence and in internal states. So we need local notions of pasts and futures, and we use light cones for that. Um, these physical systems that self-organize, we know that's a product of local interactions and how they propagate in the system. So the light cones capture the extent and history of local interactions and how they propagate. So if I'm pixel here at a current value in space-time, a point in space-time, the past light cone is the set of all points in the past that could possibly influence the current position through these local interactions. Likewise, the future light cone is the set of all points that the present could possibly influence through local interactions. So having defined light cones, we can now just apply that to our causal equivalence relations, say local causal states are the equivalence classes generated by this equivalence class, uh, equivalence relation says two past light cones now are causally equivalent if they have the same conditional distribution over future light cones. So the um, epsilon map that I have in the middle here is the function that maps from past light cones to their equivalence classes. So two light cones will be mapped to the same value under the epsilon map if they have the same conditional distribution over futures. We can use that to take a space-time field and map every point locally to its corresponding latent internal state um, using the epsilon map through the past light cone. So 
I go to a point in space time. I look at its past light cone that will have some conditional distribution that uniquely maps it to a local causal state and I can put the local causal state label in the corresponding field. Yeah. So these probabilities, um, they're basically conditional probabilities of like your current, you know, that blue, that blue grid, right? And that's based on, you know, the orange, the orange grids and then future, you know, uh, predictions or whatever, it's uh, based on the green. Right? Yes. So these probabilities, how do you, right? So you get some state representation. So that orange, that orange section is some type of past, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's your past state. Yep. Yep. Um, so that would be L negative? Yeah, L negative. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how do you, so how, how are these probabilities computed? Like how do you, like do you, are you just basically collecting data from this video and then you're developing this probability model using this? Yep. I'll go into those details in the next oh, slide, actually. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, again, I want to point out that this, this point-wise mapping allows me to, to transform an observable field to a latent state field with the same coordinate geometry. So that structural semantics, like segmentation in the observable field, can be captured through properties in the latent state field, kind of as we saw visually with the turbulence example. So as you asked, how, how do we do this in practice? The, the main goal is to estimate these distributions of pasts and futures, and we kind of do this brute force. We take our, our space-time data, and we're just going to pull out these light cones as finite length vectors. So the theoretical properties of these states um, are technically defined in the infinite past an infinite future limit, but we all, if you have finite data, you know, we can only make, we have to make finite horizon cutoffs. Um, so we need some approximations. So think, think clustering here. This is going to proceed through two stages of clustering. First, if we have real valued light cones, these finite length vectors, they're never going to exactly repeat, right? So we can't build counts of those. So what we want to do first is cluster into a finite set of clusters that we then can empirically count. And we do this with distance-based clustering. So we define this sort of gamma map that says two past two real value light cone vectors get mapped to the same cluster if under some clustering algorithm they're given to the same distance-based cluster. Um, previous work has just used Euclidean distance for this clustering. Uh, we define here uh, this particular light cone distance has this temporal exponential decay. So again, think, you know, we're in our present and we're going back some time steps. As you go further and back in time, we sort of care less about how much they agree there. So this is exponential decay. So rather than saying, I'm going to equally weight everything within my finite horizon and add, put no weight to stuff behind it, we kind of smooth that out with this exponential decay. And it actually gives a more, the temporal decay rate gives us more nuanced um, inference parameter to control how much we care about the length of history we want to consider. Um, for, oh, yeah. So I just want to ask a question. Uh -huh. So this is how do you determine what the cone shape is? For a specific point? The cone has a fixed shape that we have that, that template that we just saw, right. but then it's, it's how we're going to compare to a template to say if they're similar or not. So we care more in the template about things closer to the present, values closer to the present than but you further need two separate cones. Yeah. So you said compared to separate Yeah, so it's a distance. Like say A and B are finite vector representations of two different light cones. Okay. Other question? No, so two questions. Um, one is if you develop these light cones, um, how do you decide on like the speed of light? Yes. And the second question is this exponential decay rate. Do you um, count that to like the upper number of the spot limit or is it more of the lower number? It's more of an empirical control parameter at the moment. Right. Um, Yeah, I wouldn't immediately tie it to Lyapunov no. exponent. Um, if there's time at the end, I can talk some more about Lyapunov exponents. Um, so yeah, think of those two, you brought two questions of temporal decay rate and speed of light. Mm -hmm. um, for some systems like the cellular automator, we're gonna look at, well, it's not real value, so we don't have the temporal decay rate and the speed of light 
is easy there because it's set by the the range of interactions in that discrete field. For something like climate, the range of interaction could be, say, the speed of sound, which is just too large. So in that case, it's again a sort of empirical control parameter that says kind of sets the spatial scale of objects you want to identify. So maybe convection speed in the system. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So if you were to, so you're basically clustering these in the classes, right? Yeah. So um, do you just do you only take the distance between like cones in the, from the same time step, or if you have a cone here and then a cone whose center is here, right. do you also do that? Yes. So we assume conditional stationarity in the system, which basically if it's governed by uniform local interactions, it'll satisfy this, which is to say, wherever I see a past light cone in space time, I'm assuming that the conditional distribution that follows is independent of space time location where it's found. Right, so for real value things are gonna do this clustering for discrete value that kind of comes for free. So we have to use finite length tiles anyway. So the clusters are basically all the light cones that have the same values within that finite horizon. So when, once we have these clusters, um, we can build empirical counts over the clusters and create these empirical distributions. Then we want to cluster again on these if two past clusters of C minus have the same conditional distributions, we cluster those together just as these sort of causal equivalence classes. And those equivalence classes are approximated latent local causal states. Um, so from this, we have our, our approximated epsilon map is basically the um, combination of these two clusterings. So first we map to the gamma clustering, either distance based or just say finite horizon light cones for discrete case. And then those will have some empirical distribution that we can cluster again um, from that second clustering stage. And the, outpo the output of these uh, epsilon maps are you can think of just like sort of the label for the equivalence classes of states. Um, in a lot of the images we'll see those just correspond to different colors in the latency field, like with the fluid flow. In some cases I'll put more explicit labels on them, but they'll still be colored. Okay, so how does this work and how do they capture pattern and structure in space time? So here's one of our, um, at the top, explicit symmetry patterns that we saw before. It has translation symmetries um, in space and time, which I'll describe in a second. This is a simple space-time um, CA model. So horizontal slices are spatial configurations that evolve in time from top to bottom, as I'll describe more in a second. Um, at the bottom, we have our corresponding latent state field. So again, at every point in space-time here, we have this approximated epsilon map that will map to a corresponding local state, um, which is just unique states are given by unique colors here. And as with the uh, translation invariant string and its machine presentation, the states here capture the sort of the quotient group of these translation symmetries. So as you can see, there's some red squares and the pattern here repeats in time. There's seven steps, so I have to go through seven different colors before I come back to red, etc. This also captures generalized, pattern is generalized in, in space time. So top here is a similar observable field, does not have translation invariant. Um, it's not translation invariant, but it's latent state field is. So we'll see a, another example more in depth and see what the states are capturing in these particular cases. So as I mentioned, these are, are CA models. They're very simple, one spatial dimension, just um, binary strings in this case are my spatial lattice. They evolve according to the simple radius one update rule. Since I have binary values, there's just eight different neighborhoods I can have, and I just specify what the output for each of those is, and that's my dynamic. I apply that uniformly and synchronously to update my field. So it's very simple, but still capable of arbitrary complexity. So very nice models to study. Um, I can stack sequential um, spatial, spatial lattices together to make these space-time fields that we just saw. Okay, so these generalized symmetry regions, this is what we call domains in 
and they'll have these symmetry states that identify regions that are locally have the symmetry. And then coherent structures def are defined as sets of states that are spatially localized but temporally persistent deviations from these domain states. So in this particular case, there is an explicit symmetry in the blue region. We have these black and white triangles kind of on top of each other. There are eight symmetry states describing it. We can see there are deviations from that, and they come in three sets here. There's the red, the left is the so-called gamma plus particle. It's moving to the right. It collides with the gamma minus to create the beta, and they have their unique set of signature states that deviate from the domain region. So here's an example. If we have um, a hidden background, there might be hidden structures here. It would probably take way too long to stare at this to guess what structures might be there, but if we filter out, there are these sort of locally random walking pairwise annihilating structures there. Um, so what is the background generalized symmetry that they deviate from? Here's a, a sample field, and just to cut to the punchline, you'll see that the, the black squares, which are again ones, uh, are always bound above low, left, and right by zeros. So the pattern, if you go through space or time, in fact, you'll see there's always a fixed zero, and then it can be zero or one. Fixed zero, zero, or one, as uh, captured by this machine presentation. The, the latent states capture exactly that pattern, so A is always on white. It's the fixed zero state. B can be either black or white. That's what we call the wild card state. And it turns out that this zero wild card um, pattern of the, the set of spatial configurations described here is an invariant set under the dynamic of the CA. And we found basically it's a general correspondence between invariant sets that the CA produces and these generalized space-time symmetries in our latent states. So they really are capturing something meaningful here in terms of pattern in these systems and structures as deviations from them. Let's go back to fluid flows and describe a bit more here. Now that we introduced the method and the reconstruction and those parameters, for the middle one, um, well, okay, first on this right one, we can see that the sign of vortices, which way they're spinning, gives different signatures in terms of the states. So if we don't care about that, in the middle, we trained on absolute value of vorticity, um, which is how, how we just um, identify just vortices, not direction of vortices. And to get, to isolate the vortices on top of the background, we set large light cone depths, so past light cone depth of 14 time steps and zero temporal decay. So we captured the vortices here as sort of the most coherent objects in the flow. And the shorter fluid fluctuations in the background, potential flow get mapped to this single sort of Euclidean symmetry state. Um, for to, to capture more of that short-term um, structure in the background flow, we, we turned up the uh, temporal decay rate, trained on the regular vorticity field. Um, for distance-based clustering here, we use k-means. We also adjusted k in that inference. So just to see what these videos look like in this case. Just some kind of broad shot test to get it. You can see that, yeah, the vortices pick up here and some other stuff starts happening, and it's an interesting question of how to interpret what this other stuff is that we see. I want to play this one again, and one thing to look for, since we, we've already seen the vortices in terms of what, what's happening in the background flow, you can see if you watch the observable field, it's a few times, you'll see parts here where the flow is kind of going in, it gets sort of invisible barriers and it spreads out. And these, again, transport barriers kind of show this, where the states kind of split into two separated regions and that boundary region between them kind of follows this transport barrier. All right, time for climate data. Um, so here, we're trained on the 40 degree Camp 5 water vapor field. Um, we used, in our year, we run on 
inventory. We processed about 90 terabytes of light cone data and 6.6 .6 minutes end to end on 1024 Haswell nodes. Um, yeah, so let's just see what, what this looks like. Give some more detail about what the data is, um, the data that you're working with. Uh, so it comes from this general circulation climate model. Okay. Um, it's, there are many different physical variables used in the model. To is it like historically the analysis data, or is it just uh, simulated? Simulated. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we need dense data to get these light cones from it and do it. And yeah, I guess you do real analysis data, but simulations are nice. And also if we're interested in you know, yeah. alternative scenarios, but yeah, just, it can apply to, to other data sets. But yeah. Um, so the water vapor field is what we're trained on here. Just one of these many physical variables using this model. Um, as I played again, so, Unlike with the vortices, we're not yet able to give a unique set of states that uniquely outline extreme weather events. So we can see uh, there's some like hurricanes forming, and you can see there are some they're outlined by some states, but not uniquely so. So what we want to do moving forward to try and get there is incorporate some of these other physical variables that are in the model. Because we know, you know hurricanes are not just say, concent high concentrations of water vapor. So can we find signatures in other physical fields that will help us uniquely identify these? Um, there are a few approaches that we can do for this multivariate analysis. We can say do like vector value light cones where we take our observable fields from different physical fields, water vapor, temperature, pressure, et cetera, take sort of combined light cones from those and learn equivalence classes in combined light cones of that full state and get one latent field out that is the combined internal state for these fields. Or you can kind of do the different fields independently and then take the structural signatures you get from each of the independent latent fields and combine those together in a an, an, um, segmentation analysis. So again, we can do that through the shared coordinate geometry here. So if I say at a point, in my data, if I have some signature in water vapor fields, some particular signature in water vapor, a particular signature, like, and signature here means a particular latent state, water vapor, um, temperature, pressure, so forth. If I have those all combined, that together gives a signature of a hurricane. Um, so this is what we are actively working on at the moment. As I mentioned, you know, we ran this on Cori. We needed to do this performance um, computing we did even on the 2D turbulence data set. Uh, I'll just say if you want more details on the HPC side, I gave a talk here at the Big Data Summit in the summer and that was recorded so there's more details in the link here. The main thing is that this for the real value systems, the clustering over light cones, we need distributed clustering. That was the um, most intensive step. I'll also say that we made a point to write this in Python to, to bridge this performance productivity gap. So, you know, as, as a theorist, I could have happily spent my time on CAs and be like, oh, check it out, my method works great. And it could apply to climate and then stop there, right? Because, you know, maybe I don't want to spend the time to write it in C or Fortran to have it actually be able to apply to this. But if we have it in Python and we have these performing and optimized libraries where we can write, basically take our prototype pipeline, something like scikit-learn, and now flip a distributed equals true flag and run it on Cori, um, that's really great. And then also, if, you know, we want to hand it off later to climate scientists and <coughs> it's much easier in that case. So some future work here. What we've seen so far is like going from the left picture to the middle. So what we're seeing here 
are again these 1D spatial temporal systems. It's like they're called coupled back lattices. It's like a real valued CA. Um, so the observable field on the far left there is mapped to a latent um, state field in the middle. But we can also have a stochastic decoding back from the latent field to a reconstructed observable field. And this is now like an autoencoder, which if I wanted to use a neural network in an unsupervised fashion, autoencoders are one of the favorite ways to do that. So basically you're trying to learn the identity map through a bottleneck. And the latent representation space here is like our bottleneck. But I, I can write it out like that. And like with neural net autoencoders, you use this like um, reconstruction error as an optimization metric to train your network. Um, but I already showed how you know we reconstruct these states from data, and actually in doing that, you get this stochastic decoding along with it, as with the um, the encoding. So it's not particularly useful in this case. But what is interesting and useful is that due to Markov properties of the internal states, you can actually define a dynamic in the latent space to evolve forward in the latent space as, as an actual prediction, and then use that decoding to map back to a forecasting in the observable space. So I'll note for like the deterministic systems that we do here, you know, if I have my underlying dynamical model, I don't need to do forecasting, and as we can see, this doesn't do super well. One thing we're interested this, in this though is as an optimization metric for say hyperparameter tuning or choosing parameters, if I want to do a, um, run a bunch of climate simulations say I want to find extreme weather events. But that showed with turbulence, I can tune parameters and they give physically nice outputs that just kind of different levels of description. So is it sort of an objective way if I want to do a big survey that picks, all right, this is the level of description I want to do. Um, this idea of predictive information bottleneck of optimizing predictive forecasting error with minimal state representations. So I want to do as best forecasting as I can with as few internal states as possible. This also opens up the um, possibility of training, giving a, a more nuanced self-supervised metric to train neural networks on, which I'll speak about more in a second. Um, I mentioned before in discussing causal states that they are rely on the notion of causality but don't discover causality. Well, in this, um, for real value cases with this multivariate analysis and predictive forecasting, you can combine those together to actually have a potential way of discovering causal relations. So the basic idea is to have a couple time series here, x, y, and z, they're evolved as functions of each other. So I can have observable time series in x, y, and z, and I can do the independent latent states for each of them, or a combined latent states. And the idea is if I can, say, predict x with just itself, but then I have this joint space of X and Y and predict X from that. If my prediction is better, having incorporated information in Y, Y is somehow causally influential to X. Um, so it's related to some other information theoretic and dynamical system approaches to causal discovery. Um, I'm interested in, we're collaborating with some ecologists at Oak Ridge, interested in um, ecological memory and how, say, plants respond to changing environmental stimuli. And this is an approach I want to work on in that context. So as a recap of this future directions, the new tools are these multivariate analysis and predictive forecasting. And what we're really interested in is this, this idea of mechanism and not just identifying structures, but getting towards, you know, what goes into forming them? What is the underlying mechanisms underneath? Um, I just described how um, we might go about looking at causal mechanisms. Physical mechanisms is harder. Um, it's nice that we can do this directly from data without needing to reference equations of motion, but ultimately if we want to talk about physical mechanisms, we need to somehow tie this in with the physical laws that are encapsulated by the equations of motion that produce the data that we train on. Um, 
I'm not super clear how to do that, but I think this couple time series case is a more simple setting to play around with that. Uh, and then there's this question of like, is the finite state assumption always a good assumption? Say for complex fluid flows or climate, there's reason to believe that might be an issue. Um, so this predictive forecasting information model provides a way, as I said, to maybe look at training neural networks. So, you know, neural networks are higher class of computational models. So maybe if, you know, finite state machines aren't gonna cut it, maybe neural networks are. Um, we also have a collaborator in France who is working on uh, reconstruction algorithms and reproducing Kernel Hilbert spaces, which is useful if you have infinite states. And um, that's still in early development. So with that, I'm going to close. I think my advice is Crutchfield, uh, Arthur and Fabat, collaborators here at NERSC, um, Nalini and Victor at Intel, are their DISCO collaborators, and then Intel is kind enough to fund us in this project. I also mentioned that uh, our HPC implementation was chosen for this HPC Innovation Excellence Award, so we're very excited about that. All right, thank you. Um, that first uh, supervised learning method you mentioned that uh, it was at, it had gotten um, it had gained popularity. Mm -hmm. um, so, when, um, so if I understand correctly, they basically took the um, the Teka, which is a, a basically a Basically, basically, the parallel computation of like climate. Um, it basically it basically produces this automatic. Yeah. So, um, and then they just took they basically ran the simulation on a bunch of different images and then trained a neural network to learn this mapping. Is this what they did? Yeah, I believe they took the output of Tika from big simulations and just collated it into a set of training labels and then right. ran that. Yeah. So was it at least faster than Tika? Was Tika slow or? I imagine so. Yeah, it's faster, but it's sort of garbage in, garbage out proposition. Yes. Right. Um, algorithms that are in there, it's like looking at a cloud and sending it to like a camel or weasel or a whale. It's about that level of something more sophisticated, but um, not physics based, but in terms of imagination. Adam, I have a question for you about the light code technique. I mean, you're um, trying to translate this into a simpler statement, but I um, once you frame this in terms of light cones, what the, the technique seems to be very good at doing is looking at finding void states, explicitly good at them. And that's in a fluid context, that's because the fluid has angular momentum. <coughs> the momentum uh, forms a form of memory in the system. So it's a inherent form of persistence. You get rid of the angular vorticity. You have to disperse it and make it work with the viscosity. So there's a, it provides a very strong sort of means of uh, the vortex will really persist. And in your, your algorithm nailed those extremely well. Um, and there, there, are, there are certainly contexts where, coming back to your alternative uh, gateway question, what, but I would say rivers don't look like that. Um, so they, they represent more of a, a filamentary structure where there is there's memory, um, but it's, it's a, Do you have an explanation of why your method is so good at finding voices without any structure? I guess I'm going to frame the question that way. I think you basically described it well. Um, they have a really strong signature in vorticity, and we explicitly trained on vorticity. Um, at some point, when we were, I was playing around with right. them, Multivariate analysis. I was 
wanted to look at, could we find them from joint velocity fields? X, Y velocity is much harder in that case. Um, you could start to pick them up, but it was a lot messier than just vorticity. Yeah. And now we haven't really reached the, the characterizing limits of this method on climate data without going into the variables. Right? The single variable watching mm -hmm. which is not more information in there to be able to successfully distinguish between uh, spinning structures and linearly the affecting structures and so on. That was the, um, sorry. I mean, I just want to comment that the entire dynamic of that three determinant flows is just by that one more state equation. Sure. Um, but but in the current case, there's really nothing going on before we train down the larger EQ. Right. And therefore, I mean, it would be unrealistic to expect the method to work extremely well with just, with just that one tree. Yeah. Um, and the thing that would make me nervous uh, from that is you know, we, we've used examples of that and train on 16 variables. There are exactly four, four prognostic equations in the system. There's the state, Navier-Stokes, constituent equation, and the personal flow in the index. So um, you know, the system has to go beyond four, and I, I, I'm just saying it would make me nervous. I, but if you were to, if you were to go back to the example where you laid out a bunch of different techniques, you had finite time lap and other exponents and some of the other methods. One of the um, one of the appealing things about well, one of the things that's potentially appealing about concepts like FTLE is that you're looking at coherent structures have a very particular form in FTLE when you specify FTLEs because laminar flow on the outside is um, FTLE is currently large, long time scales, very short time scales next to the structure that's moving coherently through them in large time, large time scales inside, right? Because that it means that's moving coherently forward. You couple that with one other conserved variable, like potential vorticity or water vapor, and then you've got, you have a mean divided to square in an answer river, because that's uh, water vapor, which um, should be first order conserved variable or potential vorticity is a conserved thing. So there's some there's some coming back to your idea of going into a vectorial classification technique. Is that a direction that you think you might go? So minimally addressing this technique so that you can get out of it for other other phenomena. Or sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You had one um, comment about the causal mechanisms to the physical mechanisms. Mm -hmm. I think. I think one thing that we've, we've, we've talked about this in the past in this collaboration, but we didn't quite get to it, is besides the wild fields, you might look at derived variables of, like the potential for C or convergence or other things that you expect to be important for the mechanics of fields and events. And instead of training your algorithm on the raw um, you know, variables, you might then derive these, these physical quantities and then do the same thing because you, you can get them on a space time. Yeah, so. it's like well, you know, training on the um, square of the vorticity field to not distinguish between directionality of vortices. Okay. I had one last quick question. It had to do with your um, the idea of doing prediction. Yeah. So the uh, as we know from Ed Lorenz, um, the system has positive law and exponents. Analysis the systems that are analyzing positive not one exponents, which will cause them to go chaotic in terms of in ten days and real geophysical tool flow. It's almost as if the whole of that count is legitimate and it essentially loses coherence. It's just letting go out the and uh, so this light cone, I'm going to sort of break up in a sense. Um, so uh, is that a is that a problem when they're doing predictability? For predictability, yes. Um, I would say like, this is why we do distributions over light cones, so that if there is um, positively open up exponents, they're spreading, that increases the entropy of the distribution. But it's still captured by it. So yeah, for prediction then, I'm sampling this high entropy distribution. Um, and like we can see in this, prediction, if you don't get it right, it leads to local instabilities that will just kind of wash out. So I don't, again, I don't envision this as being like 
particularly useful for like state of the art forecasting of right. or now casting or something. Um, but it adds an interesting dimension to this and including the, the, the dynamics in these internal state representations maybe can link back to this mechanism question, but it's still very in the air of how that how that looks, yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I think we'll take one last question now from uh, David Skinner on Zoom. Um, spatial temporal coherence is interesting. Many physical systems also show symmetries and refluxes. Could you impose a Hamiltonian structure on the multivariate root uh, next to the last slide and direct simplified training or better mechanism? Potentially, it's not really something I've thought about much, but it's an interesting idea. Sure. Cool. Well, uh, thanks for sticking it out and, and staying. Uh, I know we're past the hour, but uh, I'd like to thank Adam again for a very nice talk.